it is an honor and privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Andrea Van Butis, who is the professor and chair at the Zucker School of Medicine uh, at Hofstra Northwell. And she's joining us to give us a talk on autoimmune uh, inner ear disease. So Dr. Van Butis, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, listen, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Um, feel free to stop me, ask questions, however you want to do things. I don't know what your protocol is. So anyway, I actually want to talk about both autoimmune and auto-inflammatory disease. Um, and hopefully you'll understand why I want to talk about both as we go on. So in terms of a uh, couple of disclosures, um, I'm going to be discussing something called anakinra, which is an IL-1 receptor antagonist. It is not FDA approved for autoimmune inner ear disease. All studies were performed under an, uh, an IND from the FDA. Uh, and uh, I am describing one case where we used it off-label. Uh, and I previously served as the scientific advisory board for Sobe Pharmaceuticals that makes Anakinra, uh, and they have provided drug for our present clinical trial, but I do not receive any royalties from them. Okay, so um, a lot has changed in the realm of auto, autoimmune disease, and most specifically, um, there is now a new class of diseases called autoinflammatory diseases, which typical autoimmune diseases are diseases of T cells, which is a slow response. The macrophage has to engage the T cell, and then you make autoantibodies uh, to these things. And we all know that when we've seen patients with autoimmune inner ear disease, um, they typically don't have a huge number of autoantibodies present. And even if they do, um, it's not that all of our patients have the same autoantibody. So it seems like there's something different. And so what's evolved in the field is there's something called an autoinflammatory disease, which is really a disease of the macrophage or monocyte. Um, and they can either be organ specific. So gout is now considered an auto-inflammatory disease. IBD is considered an auto-inflammatory disease. And then there's a class of auto-inflammatory diseases that actually cause sensory neural hearing loss that we're gonna discuss. Um, and so the question is, let me see if I can, is autoimmune inner ear disease actually an auto-inflammatory disease? Is it an autoimmune disease? Is it both? What about Meniere's? And then finally, what about sudden hearing loss? So I'm going to start with a case. This is a 13-year-old boy that came to my office that had a fluctuating but progressively worse sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, his symptoms initially began at the end of an asthma attack, um, and he had no vertigo, no oral fullness, no head trauma, and actually another ENT thought he was malingering. Um, and just to point out, we recently published our series on children. Uh, we looked at a series of 41 children with autoimmune inner ear disease, and the steroid response rate in children is the same as adults. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you know, I would urge you to consider the fact that this is a disease not only of adults, but also of children. So to talk about this child, um, he does have a strong family history of autoimmune disease. Uh, his mother has Hashimoto's thyroiditis. The father has juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. The clinical exam is totally normal. Uh, and he had seen a number of other people. So he had a huge amount of blood work that was all normal. Uh, and specifically his muckle wells testing was negative, which is something I'll explain as we go along. Imaging was also completely normal. Uh, and so therefore I'm going to tell you that blood work is largely not helpful in determining a treatment or making a diagnosis in these patients. This is his initial audiogram. He has a high frequency hearing loss that's slightly asymmetric. However, um, a subsequent audio you can see on the left side where his left ear drops. And then two weeks later, uh, while on high dose corticosteroids, his right ear drops. And it also brings up the question, you know, is this a child who's not steroid responsive? Is this just natural fluctuations and the steroid have nothing to do with it? And quite frankly, I'm going to argue with you uh, that he actually is steroid responsive because every time you would decrease the dose, um, his hearing would get even progressively worse. Uh, and he is someone um, that Jennifer Deerberry has seen similarly um, with these uh, patients that are steroid uh, dependent. And he was largely steroid dependent for a large period of time. So his clinical course was quite ugly. Um, he was unable to be tapered off steroids. His fluctuations would correlate with his steroid dose. Uh, he would worsen with any type of antigenic challenge, meaning if he got a bacterial infection, if he got a viral infection, if he got immunized for something. Uh, he was placed on diazide and methotrexate. 
um, diazide didn't help. Methotrexate, uh, once added, we were unable to taper that as well. Um, I also was doing intratepanic steroids on him, uh, and uh, he developed a tepanic membrane perforation. And this was over several years where his hearing had just continued to fluctuate. And so I'm going to change gears and just back up and talk about autoimmune disease a little bit. Um, autoimmune diseases now affect about 8% of the population, uh, and there are more than 80 distinct diseases. And you may wonder why they're on the rise. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at this New England Journal of Medicine article that now is almost 20 years old. But what it chronicles is that as we see a decline in infectious diseases and we've sterilized our environment, we've seen a rise in both autoimmune diseases as well as allergic diseases. And, you know, we certainly can relate to all of this. I think uh, the older people in this audience, uh, when we were growing up, uh, you almost never saw someone who had a peanut allergy in your class. And yet in our children's classes, uh, it's very common to have someone who has a peanut allergy and nut allergy or some severe sensitivity that we never used to see. So just for some definitions, as you know, there are 28 million Americans who have some type of sensory neural hearing loss. Um, but when we talk about an immune mediated hearing loss, it's potentially reversible. Uh, conditions can include sudden hearing loss, Meniere's and autoimmune inner ear disease. Um, and the, the problem with autoimmune and inner ear disease, since we really don't have a biomarker for it, um, it's, it's very difficult to categorize. And historically what some people have done is said that you have to be steroid responsive to have, have autoimmune inner ear disease. And hopefully I'm going to convince you that that's not entirely the case. So just by definitions, um, for sudden sensory neural hearing loss, it's the most common type of an immune mediated hearing loss. It's an acute unilateral drop evolving in uh, under three days and uh, 30 dB drop at three contiguous frequencies. Meniere's will have concurrent vertigo and certainly bilateral Meniere's disease and autoimmune inner ear disease is largely indistinguishable in some cases. Uh, and then I'm hoping to make a case to you that noise-induced hearing loss actually also may be, uh, have an inflammatory component to it. So to back up, um, the endolymphatic sac is really the antigen processing site of the inner ear. It receives antigen and waste from the endolymphatic duct. There are resident macrophages and monocytes that actually migrate into the sac lumen, and this was shown by Nordstrom et al. Um, and these um, cells can actually migrate back into the perisacular tissue for antigen presentation and immune processing. And there's basically a leaky membrane where cells from the peripheral immune system can get into the endolymphatic sac and go back again. Um, and there's actually a, and this was shown by Keiko Haros, um, that there's a chemokine called fractalin that actually helps to attract macrophages to the endolymphatic sac. So what is the natural history of autoimmune inner ear disease? Well, we know um, from the work of Brunnen and Meyerhoff that 70% of them are 60 to 70%, uh, John Naparco had shown 60% and Brodden and Meyerhoff 70% initially respond to corticosteroids. The problem is if you follow these patients over time, by 34 months, only 14% stay responsive to steroids. So either you could say they don't have the disease anymore if they don't respond to steroids, um, or more likely, there's been a change in their immune response such that they don't respond to steroids. And so to date, what we have for steroid resistant patients is largely rehabilitative where we give them hearing aids and cochlear implants, uh, in many cases, very successfully. Um, but for the patients that still fluctuate, it's very problematic because sometimes the hearing aids work appropriately and sometimes it's either too loud or too soft. Um, other people have looked at use of methotrexate. Um, Jeff Harris showed in 2003 in a clinical trial, methotrexate was ineffective. Similarly, um, TNF antagonists are also um, ineffective, uh, however, work in steroid-dependent patients. So if we just look at the historic rates also for sudden sensory neural hearing loss, they're very similar to autoimmune inner ear disease where 60 to 70% respond to corticosteroids. However, I will point to Maddox's uh, very famous study on, that shows that 65% of patients with sudden hearing loss actually spontaneously recover um, within 14 days. Uh, and that provides a sort of a conundrum, you know, um, are we really looking at steroid responsiveness? Because as you all know, if we don't treat them in a timely fashion, they may not respond. 
And so are we looking at spontaneous recovery or to steroid responsiveness? Uh, and then similarly, you know, is intratympanic as good as oral steroids? I think this was pretty well shown uh, by Steve Rausch in 2011 in this prospective clinical trial for sudden hearing loss showing that intratympanic therapy uh, was basically not inferior to oral. Um, and then there was the intriguing study um, uh, by Cueva's group, um, uh, where a smaller study showing that the combination was actually better, however, it's not repeated. Okay. What about in Meniere's disease? Well, we know in Meniere's disease that corticosteroids help with vertigo control. However, uh, the steroid response rate for hearing improvement is actually substantially less. Um, we know that um, uh, under 50% of them actually improve their pure tone average in response to corticosteroids. And this was uh, shown by two different groups, just to give you an idea of, of uh, corticosteroid response rates. So, you know, we're left with um, diseases that overlap. Um, we do not have any single antibody, as I said, associated with autoimmune inner ear disease. Um, and, you know, so are we um, looking at many different diseases? Are we looking at one disease? Uh, we know that 30% of patients with autoimmune inner ear disease will go on to have a systemic uh, autoimmune disease or manifest it later. Um, and as you remember, in the 1990s, it was very popular to test everyone uh, for HSP-70. Um, and this was popularized in the mid-1990s that everyone was tested for this. Um, but realize HSP-70, it's a heat shock protein. Um, and these are just cellular stress proteins. And so what they do is they get transcribed and made in various organ systems just in response to cellular stress. So it, it certainly is manifest, um, but like some of the other markers, it's really not specific to autoimmune inner ear disease. However, um, it is seen positive in both autoimmune inner ear disease and Meniere's disease. Okay. So in trying to study autoimmune inner ear disease, a number of investigators have tried to create models of this disease. And um, the most popular model was um, promulgated by Jeff Harris in uh, the mid 1980s. This was a KLH model. KLH is keyhole lymphocytic antigen. It is something found in this little mollusk in the bottom of the ocean. Uh, no human has ever experienced it. Uh, but when injected into the guinea pig, it gives a pseudo autoimmune attack. Um, similarly, um, there is something called it. Uh, MLR, LPR mouse, uh, that's um, a fast mutation mouse that, again, um, doesn't recapitulate human hearing loss. The best model, perhaps, and part of the problem with these two models is based on these, we've had proposed drug targets to use uh, that really have not borne out good results in humans. There was a peptide vaccinated model um, that was created by uh, Vincent Tui and Gordon Hughes. Uh, back in the day. Uh, this was actually a very good model in the sense that it, you could transfer CD4 T cells and it would result in disease in the transfer. Um, and we do know that um, humans can develop anticoclin antibodies, and this has been shown. Um, but there are a lot of problems, and this model was never recapitulated, and it's, it's not entirely clear why. Um, but I would think that's the best model that has been proposed to date, but that's really a model of autoimmune inner ear disease and may just be specific to cochlean autoantibodies. Um, and so more work would need to be done on that. Unfortunately, Vincent Tui has largely left the field and is working breast cancer. So I'm not sure that will ever happen. The other thing to realize is part of antigen presentation is based on something called like your toll-like receptor. Your toll-like receptor is a, uh, is a molecule that's a danger signal that really helps to initiate um, your immune system to respond. The problem is TLRs in humans are highly polymorphic, meaning we all have different genetic uh, variations associated with it. Um, and so that may be part of the reason this is so hard to study. I would draw your attention um, to a very interesting, and it's worth going to this eLife um, citation because they have beautiful pictures. But in 2018, Swinburne um, showed that if you mutated um, the LMX1BB um, in the zebrafish of the inner ear, which is very similar to the human inner ear, 
if you have the native type um, and you don't mutate it, the endolymphatic sac will dilate and then it will collapse again normally. However, upon mutation, hopefully you can see my arrow, you get rapid expansion of the endolymphatic sac and the zebrafish and it does not go back down. So one of the things that we're actually exploring, um, because when you mutate LMX1BB, uh, uh, you reduce glutaminergic glute 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 neurons. Um, and um, those neurons actually um, can be affected by both TNF and IL-1. Uh, so one of the things that we're actually exploring in combination with the lab at Cornell is if we put in some of the human immune response genes into a zebrafish model, can we develop an appropriate model? And I'm hoping in the next year or two, I can tell you a little more about that. Um, so. So I'm largely going to talk about um, cytokines that are produced by monocytes, um, both TNF and IL-1. Um, and these are the two cytokines that when made by a monocyte or a macrophage, uh, largely instigate um, T cells to do whatever they need to do. So in this case, um, in most cases, you're stimulating a uh, pro-inflammatory response from T cells and you may or may not produce antibody. But we know based on the work of Jeff Harris that TNF and IL-1 is made following KLH injection in those guinea pigs. Um, but at that time, they had decided that since TNF was, was made in response to antigen and IL-1 only in response to surgical trauma, they actually went on to do a human clinical trial um, using um, Antanercept, um, basically showing um, and the way they structured the trial was that they took patients that were um, treated with corticosteroids and asked, could they respond to a TNF antagonist to maintain their hearing? Uh, and the answer was no, actually. Um, but there is a large role for IL-1 that was largely not explored for reasons that it's not entirely clear, um, because we do know interleukin-1 is upregulated by fibrocytes in the inner ear. Um, in acoustic trauma, we do see ingress of macrophages and IL-1 production, uh, and in fact, so much more than even TNF. So acoustic trauma, is there a common mechanism of inflammation? Um, and uh, so there have been some studies looking at Greek army soldiers um, using anti-inflammatories as well as antioxidants, uh, showing better improvement. Um, Similarly, if they got IT steroids, um, they would uh, reduce the uh, impact of the intense noise trauma on hearing. But are we looking at just a temporary threshold shift? Um, is this real or not? Um, there are some compelling animal models that have looked at this, um, where we see pro-inflammatory cytokines are being produced following noise exposure in the inner ear. So if you take a look at this, diagram and you're looking at the lateral wall of the cochlea, pre-noise, there's no inflammation. By about 12 hours, you see a strong inflammatory response uh, in the fibrocytes of the lateral wall. Uh, and these are um, expressing IL-6. Uh, similarly, IL-1 spikes at about three hours, um, the same TNF spikes as well. So you see a very strong pro-inflammatory response. And in fact, others have shown uh, that in response to these early cytokines, you can make something called MMP9. MMP9 causes a leakiness of uh, membranes, uh, including the blood-brain barrier, the blood-labyrinthine barrier. Uh, and so we set up these cascade of events and we also have molecules uh, set for endogenous control, but I'm hoping uh, to suggest to you that acoustic trauma may be the inner ears um, uh, uh, danger signal that we get that produces inflammation. We now know in gout, uh, uric acid crystals trigger inflammation without secondary hits. Uh, and so this may be an auto auto inflammatory type of response. So backing up to TNF, I told you already that the Jeff Harris study had shown that when um, patients that were treated with corticosteroids successfully, um, systemic TNF antagonism uh, really did not improve these patients further. Um, it was no better than placebo. Uh, however, 
Uh, there have been two studies, one um, at your institution by Jennifer Deerberry uh, and one by Heinrich Stacker that showed in patients that were steroid dependent uh, in both cases, using two different TNF antagonists, um, that use of these TNF antagonists actually could allow these patients to be completely um, tapered off corticosteroids uh, and have stable hearing, um, which is certainly very intriguing. Um, I think that, you know, we looked in my lab um, at patients that were that had immune mediated hearing loss. We took a look at both autoimmune inner ear disease and um, sudden hearing loss patients, and then just stratified them based on corticosteroid response. And what we found is that in patients that responded to corticosteroids prior to treatment, they had very, very high levels of TNF that were secreted by their immune cells. Um, and when we stimulated their immune cells with dexamethasone, it dropped pretty dramatically. Um, but I think that one of the reasons the, the Harris study didn't see anything was because they were treating patients that had already been treated with corticosteroids. And so if you remove the TNF signal, then you may not respond anymore because you've effectively blocked it with corticosteroids. And so that may be why they never saw the response um, because they didn't have high levels of, of, of TNF anymore. Um, and so, you know, part of how we study these patients and the study design we create uh, often answers uh, different questions. And so that may have been part of the issue. The other thing that we found that um, TNF uh, gets inhibited by is something called N-acetylcysteine. And part of the reason we decided to take a look at this is the University of Miami group had done a case control study looking at the treatment of sudden hearing loss with either steroids um, with or without N-acetylcysteine, which is an antioxidant, it's over the counter. And what they saw was an almost double response rate when they combined N-acetylcysteine with steroids than steroids alone. Um, and it was specific in the high frequency range, which to me I thought was very important because we, very, we see very little variability in the high frequency range at 4,000 Hertz uh, just by chance. And then, then there was another study that, and with patients with sudden sensory neural hearing loss, where they were actually randomized to NAC alone versus steroids, and they saw a better recovery just with NAC alone. Now you could say, well, this may be akin to the Maddox study and they would have spontaneously recovered and we don't know. But what we did in the laboratory is we stimulated peripheral blood immune cells from patients with autoimmune inner ear disease. Um, and then we stimulated with uh, LPS, which is the pro-inflammatory trigger, and in, in combination with N-acetylcysteine, we saw a very nice reduction in TNF alpha release in those patients. Uh, and so, you know, I would argue to you that if you want to treat these patients, there's absolutely no downside to adding N-acetylcysteine to your corticosteroid regimen. Uh, and we do see that it blocks um, TNF very effectively. Um, and it wasn't just in our studies, but in others as well. So. So I'm hoping, I'm convincing you that we have a leaky blood-brain barrier. We can get cells from the peripheral immune system into the inner ear. And similarly, um, we can measure things in the, in the peripheral blood that hopefully is a surrogate marker of the inner ear. Um, but what we really don't know is in the cochlea, and this is work by Thalman, uh, we know that in patients with autoimmune inner ear disease in the perilymph, that there's an increased protein concentration, but we don't know what those proteins are. Are they autoantibodies? Are they cytokines? Some of it was elucidated by 2D gel electrophoresis, but we really don't have a great understanding of all of them. Um, and as I told you, part of the way that we leak and get leakage of either a blood labyrinthine barrier, a blood brain barrier is the expression of MMP9. A lot of this work was done in neurosurgical patients where they saw inflammation in the brain. Um, the counterbalancing molecule to MMP9 is something called TIMP1. It's been shown in acoustic trauma for those that recover that you have higher levels, levels of TIMP1 longer um, than if you don't recover and those TIMP1 levels don't hang around as long. Um, so when they saw it following acoustic trauma, MMP9 would go up, it would go up for about 24 hours. TIMP1 uh, takes about four days to go down. And so that's the way the body is trying to regulate itself. So we decided to take a look at the ratio of TIMP1 to MMP9 in patients with autoimmune inner ear disease, and then looked at it based on corticosteroid responsiveness. 
And what we found is that TIMP1 expression was much higher for a longer period of time in patients that were responsive to corticosteroids than if you were resistant to corticosteroids. Um, and we saw greater levels of MMP9 in patients that failed to respond to corticosteroids. Uh, so then when we looked at the molar ratio, we, we lost significance, but um, there was a clear difference. And um, to be honest, this is an area that we really don't need to investigate further because there's no molecule that we're going to use to, to address this area, but still it helped to tell the story. So the other thing is that we know in patients with autoimmune inner ear disease uh, and also in patients with Meniere's disease, there is clearly an allergic trigger for some of these patients. Um, and um, this has been uh, certainly shown by Jennifer Deerberry um, that there's a large percentage that have airborne allergy, but how does this really work? Uh, we also know that uh, mold extracts release TNF in the peripheral blood immune cells of Meniere's disease patients, um, but we really don't know exactly how this works. And so we know that for some autoimmune diseases, we can get molecular mimicry where extraneous protein looks just like something in the inner ear or wherever the body part you're targeting. And there are a number of examples of this. So one of the things that we did is we know that we're based on the work of Vincent Tui, um, that Cochlin is a ubiquitous inner ear protein. And what we did is we did a sequence alignment um, looking at various forms of mold um, with a conserved domain of Cochlin and found that there was actually a fair degree of overlap. And so we asked ourselves, you know, is this mold sensitivity related to a structural similarity between an inner ear protein and some of the environmental molds that we see? And the answer is yes. Um, this was a extremely painful experience, experience to do this experiment, set of experiments. Um, but basically what we did is we isolated single T cell clones from a patient that was mold sensitive and kept fluctuating with his hearing and put them in stimulus where we co-culture with mold for several months and just grew up from a single T cell clone to a large number of T cells uh, and then stimulated with Cochlin instead uh, and saw expression of IL-17 um, just in the, that autoimmune uh, patient compared to tetanus, which was the irrelevant uh, antigen. And so what I'm hoping to show you is that there's a number of examples. This is just one of them. I suspect there are many, many more, um, but there's cross reactivity with some of our environmental triggers and some of our inner ear proteins. And this is an area that um, certainly should be studied further. It's, it's a difficult area to study, but I think one that will hopefully uh, help us understand um, a little more about these patients. So staying on the topic of Meniere's disease a little more, as, as we all know very clearly, um, in Meniere's disease, one of the first line management is that we ask patients to reduce the amount of sodium salt. Um, it's been shown that uh, a low salt diet actually changes and increases the sodium potassium ATPase in the lateral wall of the cochlea and the stria vascularis. Uh, and that is largely thought how we regulate these patients. Diazide actually uh, alters that sodium potassium ATPase. Um, and so, you know, we largely think that dietary salt is regulated through that. It has nothing to do with antigen processing or otherwise. Um, however, one of the things that has come out um, since then is that sodium salt actually exacerbates autoimmune disease. And this has been shown in a large number of autoimmune diseases, but most classically uh, in um, multiple sclerosis. Uh, where we see that um, the macrophages uh, of the um, brain actually monitor tissue osmolarity and they induce inflammation um, and that they develop pathogenic T cells um, and that the high sodium diet um, actually would make these patients develop neuroinflammation where they were much, much worse and also increases blood brain uh, permeability. Um, we also know that clinically, uh, in relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis, there was a very strong positive correlation between uh, disease, clinical disease exacerbation and sodium intake. 
Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we've also started studying is the effect of sodium salts on, uh, on uh, the peripheral blood immune cells and the macrophages of, of patients with autoimmune inner ear disease, as well as in um, Meniere's disease. Uh, and I hope to be getting back to you about that uh, soon. We have some very intriguing results uh, in that, and I'll keep you in suspense. So uh, I keep coming back to monocytes and macrophages, um, and I'm now going to come back to that rare disease group that I told you about of auto-inflammatory diseases. And these are diseases that have a, a malfunction of the innate immune response. The most, the prototypical one is called Muckle-Wells disease. Uh, they have a high frequency sensory neural hearing loss. And their other clinical symptoms are ones that you really have to ask very carefully about. They develop transient skin rashes, uh, not ones that they go to the dermatologist for. It will show up as a blotch of red. It will disappear after 24 hours or so. They get eye irritation where they get very dry eyes and uh, bothery, um, gravelly eyes. Um, and they sometimes get joint pain and some other symptoms. Um, and so unless you're specifically asking about these things, you won't know what to look for. Uh, it can be inherited through an autosomal dominant uh, mode of transmission, um, but the disease severity is highly variable. Uh, and so you can miss it. These patients may eventually develop renal and systemic amyloidosis and treatment is very specific uh, using an IL-1 blocker. Um, and we know that in these patients that the hearing improvement uh, even if you treat with IL-1 in inhibition is really, it doesn't really help their hearing very much. Um, although there are case reports of significant hearing improvement. Okay. So it leaves me to believe, you know, are, is autoimmune inner ear disease autoimmune? Is it autoinflammatory? I'm hoping to give you some evidence. So to date, um, when we started these investigations, it, we all believed it was only autoimmune. Uh, there's Cochlin-specific T-cells. We know that um, there are Cochlin cross-reactive uh, Th17 cells. We do see some anti-heat shock antibodies. But as we all know, we've all sent tons of blood work on these patients and we come up pretty empty. Um, but if it's an auto-inflammatory disease, these patients will not have autoantibodies present. And in fact, when we looked at anti-Cochlin antibodies in our cohort, we actually saw very low titers, which would be more of an auto-inflammatory type of phenotype than autoimmune. Um, and so, you know, the question is, even if we look at Kogan's disease, which we all classically know, um, has a bilateral sensory neural hearing loss and vestibular symptoms and interstitial keratitis, uh, they do respond to corticosteroids, um, but recently it's been shown that they respond to TNF antagonists. Muckle-Wells disease also has that same high-frequency sensory neural hearing loss. They develop conjunctitis, uveitis, um, and other, other symptoms, and they respond to IL-1 blockade. Is Kogan's and Muckle-Wells the same? Um, they may be similar and more similar than we ever really thought. In Muckle-Wells disease, you can send genetic testing for these patients. Um, what you're looking for is a gain of function mutation in a gene called NLRP3. It's also called CIAS1. Um, we also know um, that in patients with steroid response of hearing loss, um, there are genetic abnormalities also in POU4F3. Um, and then in Meniere's disease, there are a couple of other genes that have been associated with Meniere's. Um, but in all of these cases, um, especially uh, autoimmune inner ear disease, and uh, I'd love to hear from the, cl the clinicians that have seen these patients for a while, you almost never see an afflicted first degree relative unless in Meniere's disease patients where a mother may have it or a daughter or a sister. Um, but in autoimmune inner ear disease, it's incredibly uncommon to see an afflicted first degree relative. So this is a clinical case, um, another little kid. Um, and she came to me with a diagnosis of sarcoid. Um, she had uveitis, uh, urticarial skin rashes, headaches. Uh, she had a spinal tap for her headaches that was negative. She was diagnosed with aseptic meningitis. Uh, she had a new onset sensory neural hearing loss that not, did not respond to corticosteroids. Her CRP level was high. Um, she was positive for her ANA and rheumatoid factor. And she was treated with prednisone, but did not respond. This was her audiogram, her MRI is normal. 
So I sent her um, for an NLRP3 uh, sequencing and she was positive um, for that. Uh, and so this child has Muckle-Wells disease. Um, so unless you're thinking of things like Muckle-Wells disease, you don't know it's test for it. And in fact, uh, she was sent to me by a rheumatologist um, who was quite surprised uh, when I went back to her and said, you need to treat the child for Muckle-Wells disease because this should re really be their, their wheelhouse, not ours. So in patients with, and the overarching term for these are CAPS diseases, um, they do have sensory neural hearing loss that's worse than the higher frequencies. NOMAD is another CAPS disease, uh, just like Muckle-Wells. Um, and sometimes they may even present with a mixed hearing loss. Um, usually they do not have vestibular dysfunction. Um, and the other thing to realize is that these patients also have headaches and migraine-like symptoms. Um, and so one of the things that you need to think about in your Meniere's patients, you know, um, we see patients that we know um, have sensory neural hearing loss. They have migraines. We see them. We don't think they're Meniere's, but really don't know what's wrong with them. At least I do. I, I'm, you guys are smarter than I am. So, um, but we see these patients that have these sort of migraine associated dizziness and sensory neural hearing loss. Their audiometric pattern doesn't really fit with anything that we'd call Meniere's disease because they tend to be high frequencies. Um, but these patients with autoinflammatory neurologic manifestations also can have aseptic meningitis, they have increased intracranial pressure, and they have, may have ventricular megaly. Um, so it's something that you should keep on your radar. Now, how do we look at these patients? Well, most patients with an autoinflammatory disease will have an elevated CRP level. Um, CRP is a nonspecific um, uh, response, you know, inflammatory response protein uh, that we see. Now, people have looked at CRP associated with sensory neural, sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, it has been elevated in one particular study. However, in a Japanese cohort, there was no difference. And then Keiko Horos also had looked at it, sorry, uh, and found a small percentage of patients had it elevated. Um, and so it really, I think it depends on the cohort you're looking at, but certainly for autoimmune inner ear disease, I think it's worth looking at. Um, I had a resident uh, recently take a look at a series of patients with um, um, autoimmune inner ear disease. And what he found is that um, IL-6 was elevated. Uh, now the significance of looking at IL-6, it's a surrogate marker for CRP and CRP is a surrogate marker of IL-6. Um, but we found in patients that did not respond to corticosteroids in their plasma, they had very high IL-6 levels as opposed to corticosteroid responders, which had very low levels. This was uh, significant. This was published this year in Otology Neurotology. Uh, and what he did is he correlated because we had values of uh, CRP that we tested all the patients for. And what we found is it was a very good surrogate marker of uh, corticosteroid responsiveness or non-responsiveness. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you want to do one blood test that will come back fairly quickly, a CRP will come back very quickly. Uh, there's nothing special about it. it, can go to any lab, but if you see a CRP level that's sort of out of the norm, uh, you may be dealing with someone who has an elevated IL-6. You can uh, test for IL-6 specifically, it takes a little longer to come back, and there really aren't much, there aren't many normative values out there to tell you, you know, how to deal with that. And we looked at said rate by comparison, and there was really no correlation. So um, we went on to look at interle interleukin one beta, and I'll explain why. Um, we looked, and this is a busy table, but we looked at an initial cohort of nine patients um, that either had autoimmune inner ear disease or stable longstanding hearing loss of uh, no immune significance and correlated them um, by um, at that time microarray. Uh, and so what we did is we harvested the perilymph of these patients at the time of cochlear implantation and stimul stimulated their peripheral blood immune cells. We also vaccinated all of them with Nuvavax two weeks before, and that became our irrelevant antigen. And what we found is that in patients that had autoimmune inner ear disease, they overexpressed something called the IL-1 type two receptor. Um, and the IL-1 type 2 receptor is basically an immunologic sponge that soaks up inflammation and has no downstream signaling. 
Um, and so what it suggested to us is that somehow the IL-1 pathway was involved, um, but we didn't see IL-1 on the microarray itself. And so what we ended up looking at further is then we decided, well, can we predict corticosteroid responsiveness in autoimmune inner ear disease patients based on expression of this IL-1 decoy receptor? And the answer was yes. This was a series of 20 patients. We took their peripheral blood immune cells uh, and stimulated with dexamethasone in vitro, then asked about corticosteroid responsiveness. And there was almost a million fold difference. Now you would say, well, a million fold, that has to be like, you know, wrong um, because you never see differences that big. And the reason the difference was so large was that if you were someone who responded to corticosteroid, you didn't have any expression at baseline. And the patients that didn't respond to corticosteroids had a very high basal level, uh, which is why you saw such a huge difference by uh, real-time PCR. Um, and it suggested endogenous inflammation. And so then we kind of work backwards. Well, if IL-1 R2 is around, IL-1 must be around. And so then what we did is we looked at plasma levels of IL-1 and found in corticosteroid non-responders, the big bar, that they had very high levels of IL-1 in their plasma. And that is probably why they didn't respond to steroids. We took it a step further and took their peripheral blood immune cells and stimulated with dexamethasone. And we see that you know, in patients that respond to corticosteroids, they release very little IL-1 from their cells, but in response to dexamethasone, um, the patients that don't respond to corticosteroids, they have very high levels of IL-1 that's being released. It's not blocked by steroids, but it was blocked by anakinra, which is that IL-1 receptor antagonist, which led us to go on to do a clinical, very small open label clinical trial um, of patients that didn't respond to steroids and we treated with anakinra for 84 days. Uh, and what we found um, is that um, we improved, um, and this is now responders to anakinra, but we improved both their pure tone average and we improved their word recognition score, um, uh, word recognition score by about 28%, pure tone average by about uh, 12 dB. Now, just for point of reference, the uh, autoimmune inner ear disease serial audiometry trial, um, the they saw an improvement in word recognition score of 8% and pure tone average uh, improvement of less than 5 dB. So um, just to put into perspective of what you would expect to see from a response. Uh, we also saw a drop in IL-1 plasma levels in this patients, suggesting that this was a real response rather than um, you know, just um, wishful thinking or placebo effect. Um, I would also say that we sequenced all of these patients for the Muckle Wells mutation that were all negative. So that brought us to take a look at monocytes from these patients. Um, and we found a real conundrum that we didn't understand for a while because we took control patients and looked at IL-1 release when we stimulated with either LPS or LPS plus ATP, um, and they had incremental release. But corticosteroid responders had huge differences compared to the non-responders. Yet if I'm telling you the non-responders make higher levels of IL-1, um, how does this happen? It doesn't make any sense. And so I'm like, you know, I kept talking to the guy in the lab, Dr. Patak. I was like, is there a problem? What's wrong? You know, why are we seeing this? And we couldn't understand it. And then we looked at the literature about Muckle Wells patients, and they saw the exact same thing, where Muckle Wells patients actually release almost no IL-1 um, from their monocytes, which again, they're exquisitely sensitive to IL-1 inhibition. So this didn't make any sense. Are we looking at the wrong cell type or what's going on? So at the same time, we were looking a little more about IL-1 and processing in these patients. And what we found is they actually process IL-1 very differently compared to what standardly we think would happen. So usually, and this is a picture of IL-1 on the bottom, classically, when we have pro-IL-1, it gets cut to 17 kilodalton protein, um, and that's how we get inflammation. And it's only if you make the 17 kilodalton protein, you get inflammation. But we're seeing we only get a 28 kilodalton pro protein, and we published in 2020 um, in JCI Insight, um, but we only got this 28 KD protein. Uh, which means that we're cutting at this point, and we actually proved it, 
Um, and we're uniquely cutting it with a different enzyme than people realize. Uh, usually you create the 17 KD product from caspase one, but we're finding that it's caspase seven. Um, we also took this protein, we actually proved it by mass spec, and then we actually synthesized this protein, stimulated immune cells. And we found that this 28 KD protein was as pro-inflammatory as the 17 KD protein. Um, and interestingly, other people had seen this, seven, this 28 KD protein around, but never really took a look at it. But we saw it's uniquely made by caspase 7, uh, and it's extremely pro-inflammatory. So one of the things that we've been doing is we have actually been trying to synthesize, and I'm going to go up one slide just to show you. We've been trying to synthesize a unique antibody between this region and this region, which wouldn't pick up the 17KD, and we're hoping maybe a biomarker for these patients uh, because of this unique cleavage. So currently we're doing a next phase clinical trial of Anakinra. This is now placebo controlled. And we also decide to enroll Meniere's disease patients uh, in large part also by the work of other groups that show that in patients with bilateral Meniere's disease, there's high basal levels of IL-1 uh, and IL-1 and TNF even in unilateral disease. Uh, and so this current trial is ongoing where they're randomized to one of three arms uh, receiving either Anakinra first, placebo first or, or both. Um, through both two periods, um, and we do not have results of this at this time. So basically, um, in summary, um, what we think is that uh, the steroid-resistant phenotype of patients with autoimmune and ear disease, where everyone historically thought that these patients actually had no inflammation, they actually have overwhelming inflammation, that that inflammation is largely IL-1 mediated. Uh, the decoy receptor is uh, produced in response to endogenous inflammation. Um, initially, we were hoping it would be a good, good biomarker of steroid resistance. Um, we don't think it's great, but um, it is certainly available, uh, not commercially av available, unfortunately. Um, but we really feel that, you know, interleukin-1 beta, um, both on our work and the work of others, uh, is an integral protein um, that may trigger an inflammatory response and subsequent hearing loss. Uh, we certainly see this in auto-inflammatory diseases as well. Um, and so what I would suggest to all of you is that I think autoimmune inner ear disease is a combination of an autoimmune and auto-inflammatory disease. Um, it do, it's, doesn't have the classic appearance of muckle wells. We've sequenced for that and we have not found it. Um, but there are pathways that are involved that um, steroids affect the TNF pathway. Um, you can certainly try to inhibit that. And, and um, the work of uh, Jennifer and others have shown that, you know, in steroid dependent patients, it's been beneficial. Um, we've seen that IL-1 in steroid resistant patients has been beneficial. And then the other trial that was very intriguing was the AM111 study, which I think you guys participated in as well, which is a JNK antagonist. Um, it did not pass in the phase three. It uh, showed a provocative and interesting positive results in the phase two clinical trial. Um, and JNK sits downstream of both TNF and IL-1. So I think we probably still will see a lot more about JNK in the future. Um, but so going back to our patients, uh, the first patient that I showed you with a fluctuating hearing loss that I could never control, we actually did start him on Anakinra. Uh, we were able to wean him off steroids and methotrexate uh, and preserve his hearing thresholds. Um, he uh, reverted back to his initial audiogram of the high frequency hearing loss. Um, he was switched to Alaris, which is a long acting IL-1 inhibition. Um, and he has performed exceptionally well. He's graduated in Ivy League College and uh, he's presently in law school. The little girl that I showed you with Michael Wells disease also was placed on an IL-1 antagonist. Uh, she had a dramatic improvement in all, all of her skin and ocular manifestations. Her hearing never improved, um, but her CRP levels certainly normalized. And so what I would leave you with is the hypothesis that we currently believe um, is that when you have a high IL-1 level relative to, uh, I'm sorry, a high TNF level relative to IL-1, uh, we think that is a steroid sensitive phenotype, as opposed to if you have a high IL-1 level and low TNF level, we feel that you're steroid resistant. Um, and certainly, you know, we continue to look at this. Um, we're in the process of trying to develop a unique antibody for that region of IL-1 that I showed you. 
uh, we're also trying to establish a uh, animal model that we can test other drugs that may be more effective. Today, IL-1 inhibitors are uh, unfortunately all by injection. Uh, there are no oral IL-1 inhibitors. Uh, and um, you would think that patients don't want to take a daily injectable, which Anna Kinner is. Uh, and I would uh, suggest to you that uh, the opposite is true. Patients are very willing to do anything they can to preserve their hearing. So um, hopefully uh, I didn't lose anyone um, and thanks. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.